Good morning, Crossroads Church. Wherever you are, if you would just put your hands together and give God some good Sunday morning praise. Tell them thank you, God, for being who you are in our lives. Hallelujah, Jesus. We just want to welcome you to Crossroads this morning. We are so, so glad to have you here to worship and praise the Lord with us. Come on, wherever you are, if you would just put your hands together and give God some glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on. Hey. 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 Come on. Hey. Woo. You got you to gotta lean with this one. Hey. You got to lean. <laughs> praise the Lord. Come on. We have the faith to believe that your promises are sure. And you speak the word, it's established. It will accomplish what you have set out to do. For you are the God of greater. Yes, you are the God. You are the God of bigger. And you are the God. You are the God of more. Hey, we are your people. Oh, yeah. And we know Come on, say. you will perform. Yeah. yeah. Trust whatever you're doing. 
Yes, you are the God of bigger. Yes, you are the God of more. We are your people. And we know you will provide. Come on, wherever you are. If you know that the Lord is going to perform a great work in your life, come on, put your hands together. Open up your mouth and give him some glory today. Say, thank you, God. We trust you. We're leaning on you today, Lord. We know that you will perform in our lives, even if we don't know what, what you're going to do, God. We still trust that your name, if your name is in it, then I want to be in it too, God. We love you. We praise you today. God, you are the God of greater. You are the God of bigger. You are the God of more. We are your people, and we know that you will perform. God, we trust in you and your plan. God, we lay aside our will, and we accept whatever is in front of us. As long as it comes from you, God, I accept it, and I am willing to wait for you to perform. Whenever you are ready, God, I'm ready with you. We love you. We praise you. We honor you. Be with your people throughout this week coming on. God, show yourself so mighty, so faithful, so available to them. Make sure that they know that if they need anything, all they have to do is ask. You are a God that answers and hears and loves and thinks about us every minute of the day. Don't forget that your God loves you more than you can ever imagine. We want to accept your word today in our hearts and our minds, God. We want to receive the word from you, Lord. Whatever is in store, we are ready to accept. We bless the people who are bringing your word today, God. Bless them from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet. We love you. We praise you. And as a family, we say three times together, amen, amen, and amen. days of the year because we get to honor what I consider one of the most powerful groups of people on the planet, our mothers. Mothers are a powerful group and they're powerful because you know what? They are the backbone of our homes. They support our homes. They're also the strength of our communities. Mothers are also the heartbeat of our country and they bring beauty and peace to our world. Amen. So today is an, a well-deserved celebration of those wonderful, powerful moms. Well, you know, moms, they, they, they have this, they, they get that distinction because they burn the midnight oil. They burn the midnight oil. They go above and beyond. They do whatever's necessary to make sure their family has what they need when they need it, and for however long they need it. Moms are on the spot to make sure that their family, that their children, their families have what they need. Whether it's being up all night with that sick child, or whether it's completing college applications, or Lord have mercy, that sixth grade or the science project. Whatever it is, mom makes sure that she is there to meet that need. So you know, we should not be surprised when moms start to feel overwhelmed mm. or start to feel tired yeah. because there is so much responsibility on them and they take it on, but sometimes they feel unseen and unappreciated. Mm. And they find themselves asking the question, what's the point? What's the point? So moms, we got a word for you today. We want you to know that we hear you and we see you. And so we have a word for you today. We begin a series today called, What's the Point? And over the next three weeks, we wanna give you some insights 
to help you navigate that time when you feel overwhelmed and un unseen and you hit the wall and you ask the question, what's the point? So I want to, I want to go ahead and give a shout out to the mother of my children, my queen, my confidant, my partner in crime, my wife of 30 plus years. Happy Mother's Day, babe. So what's the point? So today we're going to talk about this whole idea of self-care. So I brought a couple of definitions so that we can so that we're on the same page to right out the gate. Because Margie just said mama's busy taking care of everybody else. So what opportunity does she have for self-care? Does she even understand what self-care is? So let's let's define it. I got some help from the Hunter Institute of Mental Health, and their definition of self-care is as follows. And I quote, self-care is defined as activities undertaken with the intention, intentional activities of what? Intentionally enhancing energy, restoring health, and reducing stress. Activities that are done with the intention of, this is self-care, enhancing energy, restoring health, and reducing Stress. So I hear somebody saying, well, that's a great definition, Pastor, but what exactly does self-care look like? Well, we brought, again, some insight from England, from the mental health first aid group in England. And here's some suggestions that they offer us as it relates to self-care. Now, can I go out on a limb? I know it's Mama's Day, but these tools and these tips and these insights actually can apply to anybody who needs self-care. So what does self-care look like? Self-care, I brought a couple of things. It could be spending time alone. Taking care of yourself means sometimes it's okay to tell people, I'll be right back. Self-care, watch this, may include asking for help. I know we're supposed to know that you need help, but there's one surefire way to make sure that I know you need help, and that is to say, I need help. How about taking a step back? The other day I was working on a project and that all day and it frustrated me so bad. And I, my wife said, take care of yourself, take a step back. And I got up this morning. I was like, you know what? I think I found a solution. Sometimes you have to let it go so that you can fix it. Mm. Self-care can be defined as forgiving yourself. Self-care can be defined as saying no. Self-care can be defined as putting yourself first for a change, mama. How about this? Fix your own cereal. It's in the cabinet where it's always been. And the milk is somewhere on that top or bottom shelf where it's always. Fix your own. Self-care could be asking for what you need. And lastly, self-care can be defined as setting boundaries. So we're going to take a look at God's definition of self-care today, first and I, by answering the question, if I'm taking care of you, who's taking care of me? Mm. If I'm taking care of you, who's taking care of me? Amen. So moms definitely take care of others and it is exhausting. So occasionally we want to encourage you to be a little selfish and nurture your own mental health. Nurture your own mental health. You know, it's important that you nurture your mind because taking care of others can drown out the voice of God. And it is, so, it is so important that we hear God's voice, but we get so busy taking care of other folks, we can't even hear God's voice. Paul has something to say in Colossians. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. He says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. And listen to his prayer. It is to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. It is so important that we all become fully acquainted with what God would have for us because we can get so overwhelmed and so consumed with everybody else's whims and desires that we don't, of the people that we care for, that we don't hear God's voice and we don't even know what God's will is for our lives. So when we say, so what we have to do is that we can sometimes say no to them so that we can say yes to time with God. Amen. So we spend that time with the Lord so we, we can hear his voice. And so when we're with God, what are we asking him for? Paul tells us, 
We have three things that we ask God for based on this passage from Paul. He says, we ask that we, we ask God to fill us. You know, when we're overwhelmed and we hit the wall, we're empty. And so we go to God and we say, God, fill us. Because those empty places, those hollow places will get filled with fear. It'll get filled with doubt. And that's the last thing we need. But when we've hit that wall, we've got to go to God and say, God, fill me because I am empty. Yeah. Secondly, we want to ask God not just to fill me, but fill me with the knowledge of your will. Mm. God, I want to know what your will is for today, for this particular situation. And God, I need to know your will because this knowledge is beyond just what somebody told you. This knowledge that we're asking God to fill us with is way behind, beyond some secondhand knowledge. This is knowledge that is personal and, and it, is, it is personal and directly from God. So in order to do that, because you know so much knowledge can be learned, we can read all the books we want to, right. but divine knowledge mm -hmm. is revealed. Mm -hmm. And God reveals that to us when we set aside time just to hear from him. It means turning the TV off. It means getting quiet. It means getting in his word because we have to be responsible. Nobody's going to do this for us. We have to be responsible for cultivating an environment for us to hear from God That's or good. for God to reveal that spiritual, uh, that, uh, that divine knowledge to us. So we have to make sure we set aside that time in order to nurture our own mental health. That's good. I like that whole idea of cultivating uh, an environment that's conducive to spiritual growth Absolutely. and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the hustle and bustle of daily life. It's not conducive. It's take, it's good to pay bills and take care of this, and that, but to cultivate spiritual growth, I agree with you. Sometimes you got to step aside and say, you know what, this is me cultivating relationship with God. So, um, you three asks, Paul said, I need you to ask that I'm filled. He need to ask the Lord to fill me with the knowledge of his will. And thirdly, Paul says, I need you to ask that I, that you, that you, I need you to fill me, Lord, with spiritual wisdom. This is good. Spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, spiritual wisdom and understanding is, is wisdom and understanding that's dominated by the Holy Ghost. Everybody, we're in an age when opinions are a big deal. Every account you have, you got an opinion or somebody feeding you opinion. But Paul said, I don't need to be filled with the opinions of other people. Even the folks that I'm taking care of, they got opinions. He says, no. I need to be filled with knowledge and wisdom and insight from the Holy Ghost, from the Holy Spirit. See, this wisdom and knowledge, this is wisdom and knowledge that's produced and that is taught by the Spirit. Now, this is important. He knows what God requires of us in specific situations. See, the Spirit of God is already, in, he's in contact with, with the Father, and he knows what God wants for you in specific situations. So you have to be in a position, as first said to you, to hear from the Spirit of God in a specific situation, and he's got what you need. Now, to be clear, the wisdom and the insight of God isn't really that difficult to find. It amazes me how we're, you know, we, I'm, Pastor, I'm going to search, and I'm just going to, it's going to take me three weeks to find the will of God. Not necessarily so, but it does require that you have an, uh, as a seeker, watch this, that you have an attitude which enables God to make himself known to you. I'm, I'm sorry to go back to the, the uh, uh, have I lost my mind message, but spiritual wisdom and understanding requires that your attitude is such that you open up a lane for God to fill up. But if you got everything, then you don't need him. And he says, cool, I'll see you when you get back and you will be back. First John chapter one, uh, chapter two, verse 20 says this. This is important. You have to have an attitude which enables God to make himself known to you. First John chapter two, verse 20. But you have an anointing. Watch this from the Holy One and you know all. This is good. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. So here's what he's saying here. Paul's saying that you have an anointing. Now, we mysticize everything spiritual in Scripture, but I love when you do a study of the Scriptures first and you look at what he, what he meant, because what he said is what he meant, and what he meant is what he said. Here it is. The anointing here means, wait for it, communication. He says, you have a means of communicating with God. 
a supernatural sanction you have. You have an endowment. You have a blessing. You have an anointing. That's what your anointing is. It's, it's permission to hear from God, from the Holy One. And he said, and you all know, literally he's saying you have the capacity to see if you simply stop and take the time to look. Now, one way, I'm sorry, to nourish your mental health is to cuddle the good stuff and discard the dumb stuff. We laughing because, amen, I'll, good stuff you cuddle, dumb stuff. Some of us are in trouble, mama, because we're too busy embracing other folks' dumb stuff. I'm out the way first. Go ahead, show on Philippians. Paul said that a little differently. <laughs> In Philippians chapter 4, <laughs> let's take a look at it. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And Paul said the same thing, pretty much, because he said, finally, brethren, whatever is true, that's what you want to cuddle. That's what you want to embrace. Because if it's false, you got to discard it. Mm. He said, so whatever is true, you want to embrace. He said, whatever is honorable, let's embrace that. Let's think about that. Because if it's dishonorable, what are we going to do with it? We're going to toss it. It's got to mm. go. He said, whatever is right, you brace, embrace that. Hold on to that. But whatever is wrong, it's got to go. You have got to discard it. Your mind does not have time to think on things that are wrong. No. Discard it. He said, whatever is pure, yeah. embrace it. Whatever is lovely, embrace it. Whatever is of good repute embrace it if there is any excellence any excellence think on those things we don't have time to think about things that are second rate we're god's children so make sure your mind is focused on those things that are excellent and if anything worthy of praise dwell on these things i like he said, that that's what you got to think about i like that the word dwell is uh actually an accountant's term it's a it's a mathematical term Dwell literally means take the time to balance the books. This is good. See, when you're bombarded with dumb stuff, you don't really pay attention to all the good stuff. You don't balance the books. It's, t it's easy. When you ask somebody, give me a list of negative things about somebody, they, man, I'm glad you asked, right? And then you turn around and say, okay, give me something positive. Try this with your kids. Tell me how, how, how stupid your brother is. Oh, he's so stupid, he, right? Then you say, tell me how, give me some positive stuff. Um... Uh, see, when you, you you don't when you dwell on the wrong things, you have an imbalance in your books. You can't see good because all you're doing is dwelling on dumb stuff. I want to go out the limb and say your kids aren't bad all the time. There is a window, right, when they're actually good, and you have to think about that thing. Dumb stuff simply here's why it's important to balance the books by dwelling. Dumb stuff tends to pull us down. So you can't look in a broken mirror to get a true reflection of who you are. You can't. See, dumb stuff, you, when, you, when, you, when you're focusing on dumb stuff, it's like looking in a, in a broken mirror trying to figure out what you look like. The image is always going to be distorted. I don't know who, quote, who said this, but so it's anonymous, but he said or she said, it's not your yesterdays, but your tomorrows that shape who you are. So when you're focusing on dumb stuff, you're focusing on your yesterdays. And God said, ah, that's yesterday. My, mercy, my mercies are new. How often? Ooh, every morning. Come on, somebody. Every morning. Mm. You know, Paul said that too. He said, I'm forgetting the stuff that's behind because mm. I'm pressing forward. That's what he said. So we're looking forward to our tomorrows. Amen. So we've asked that you be a little selfish. Just a just little, a little bit. selfish. Just a little bit. And, and nurture your mental health. And secondly, we encourage you to improve your physical health. Uh, improve your own come physical on, health. Come on, come on, come on. Not my favorite subject, but necessary. Come on, come on. So, so how does a caretaker, what does a caretaker do to improve their physical health? So we got two suggestions. Two simple suggestions. Two suggestions. The first one is laugh more and eat less. I know they want this to be complicated, but we ain't complicated. Yeah, and I ain't crazy about that second one. But <laughs> I think it's necessary. Laugh more, because laughter is even good for your stomach muscles. So, hey, mm. you get a little physical activity mm. in there for laughing. That's good. But laugh more and eat less. 
So let's talk about laughing. Proverbs, let's take a look at Proverbs 17, 22. It says it best. It says, a joyful heart is good medicine. It's good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Laughter is just like medicine. It creates that environment for healing. It does. It is, it is, just, it is just good. That, we're talking belly laugh. Yeah. When we were talking about this message, we remembered uh, game night at the Boone House one uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah, recently. Few, it actually has been a few weeks ago. Our kids were up from um, Florida, and everybody was at the house. You know, that's a mom's dream, all the kids in the house. It was wonderful. And so we decided to play this really silly game. And my oldest, who is my serious child, serious those child. other two, they'll laugh at anything. But my oldest child, very serious. And he read, you have to read these cards to do with the game, but he got tickled. And he was, I mean, belly laugh, tears rolling down his face. He was dying laughing, but nobody knew what he was laughing about. But before long, everybody around the We're table was laughing. We're all laughing. We're like, what's funny? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, what what's are we funny? laughing about? But that was a it's precious contagious. moment in our house. Yeah. I mean, it was just filled with laughter. That's one of those moments that moms dream of. Mm. I mean, everybody was laughing. Granted, we know what we were laughing about, <laughs> but we were laughing. Laughter is a beautiful thing. Mm. And so we have to make sure we choose to laugh more. Because... The flip side of that, the opposite is the broken spirit. Mm. And the Bible tells us here that the broken spirit dries up the bones. And that speaks of withering strength. When we have that broken spirit, it zaps our strength. Mm. So we have to choose to laugh more. You know, that's one of the things that I really value. We are, stuff is not, don't get it twisted. Everything wasn't fixed that night. No. We all still had bills and mortgages and doctor's appointments and yeah. things yeah. to do and things we wish we didn't have to do. But every now and again, we, we just we just laugh, not at the expense of other people. Exactly. Exactly. But we laugh yeah. at ourselves. Well, you know, and uh, I saw something recently. I saw a sign that says it's not the your life does not have to be perfect to be good. So you can have a That's good, good life without it being That's perfect. Because if you're waiting on perfection. Good luck. Not going to happen. Good luck. So secondly, we want to eat less or eat right. Mm. Maybe a better way to put that. So let's take your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. So remember, we're talking about improving your physical health. And our suggestions is that you laugh more and eat less. So Paul has something to say here in Romans about eating going to start in verse chapter verse 21 chapter 14 verse 20 he says do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food all things indeed are clean but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense hmm. it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles I think we ought to, we have, it's important that we put this in context mm -hmm. because uh, the Apostle Paul is a deep guy and he addresses specific issues. And what we try to do often is try to glean from the principles. It may not be applicable directly to us because he was writing to the book, to the, the Roman church. But let's put this in context. Paul was clearly here addressing a particular group of people. I want to call them the obstinate and the headstrong. The, they, though the folks who are attached to their own opinions uh, about the distinctions of eating and drinking. So you got to understand the New Testament church, everything was new. They had just come out of the legality of, of the law. And so now we're, now we're talking about grace. And some people thought grace meant permission to do whatever I want to do when I want to do it, bump you. If I think it's okay, you don't have to think it's okay. See, the mature in Christ have to govern themselves in such a way. This is what Paul's saying, that they don't dis dismantle, that they don't... Um, uh, disrupt the growth process of the immature in Christ. Let me try to say that again. The mature in Christ have to govern ourselves in such a way that we don't uh, disrupt the growth process of the immature. Now, what you're mature enough to do sometimes for a baby Christian, may they go, ooh, right? And that's what Paul was saying here. Eat and drink have become 
one of those ooh moments for the baby Christians here. See, those, these are the folks he's addressing here who had no problem with their habits, even though their habits caused other brothers to sin. Does that make any sense to anybody? So he says, in the text, he says, specifically, he says, do not tear down the work of God. Now, this is a reference to pulling down of a structure. You've seen it before, the uh, shows where you set detonators around a building in the building and it, on 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and the building implodes. That's what Paul's saying. He says, you got to be careful that, that, you're, that you're eating and drinking doesn't implode the life of somebody else. That's heavy. Literally, it means tearing down that which God is building up in somebody. You don't ever want to be guilty of tearing down in somebody what, what God is building up in them. He also says, do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean. So this is, this is where it gets a little controversial. All things indeed are clean. See, the Levitical laws are dead. They don't apply to Christians anymore. I don't know when you had a pulled pork sandwich, but you didn't feel like you were sinning the last time you did. That's all right. I ain't giving me any amens in the house, but somebody know what I'm talking about. I, man, barbecue ribs, bruh, sauce everywhere. Who am I talking to? Sauce everywhere. Sauce on the side, sauce on the ribs. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. But back in the day, all that pork eating, folks were like, well, I thought you were saved, brother. You're doing that. See, under the Christian dispensation, you can eat what you want to eat. The Levitical laws, as I said, are not binding to the Christian. However, it's important that we live our lives in a way that they don't become an offense to a brother or a sister and cause them pain. Most importantly, you don't want to do something that drives folks away from the church. So what's the principle for us to glean first? I think what Paul is saying here, the question is not, the question to consider is not whether or not my diet is an offense to my brother or my sister. The question is, what has I, the question is, does, has what I eat, has when I eat, and has why I eat become an offense to me? So we're talking about taking care of your, taking the time, mama, to take care of your, your, your physical health. So we're no longer concerned about because the Levitical law is, is what it is. I want to I want to glean from this. I'm not longer concerned so much about right now for just for a moment how Terry's affected by what I eat. I'm asking you, is what you're eating affecting you? It is what it is. I remember growing up back in the day, this little cartoon uh, campaign that said you are what you eat from where some of your old schools. Young people are like what is he talking about from your head down to your feet? And, and, it, and it's an old commercial, Rome, but it's a, new, it's a, it's a relevant truth. Um, the question is, am I building up the temple of God in me or am I tearing down the temple of God? This is good coming out of COVID. This is good because in COVID, we, were, we, we, we don't do drugs. We don't smoke and chew and go out with girls who do. But we do hamburgers and fries and ramen noodles. We amen somebody. Come on, who am I talking to? We eat really well. I, I, I remember, I'm a, the needle's going to fuss at you. I remember they were talking about Grubhub. They were like, oh, see, now you're meddling, Pastor. Now you're meddling. For the believer, particularly us, come on, sisters in Christ, when you're not taking, when you're taking care of everybody else, you stop taking care of yourself. And you start eating. Am I going too far, First Lady? You start eating, and then you start consuming things that aren't good for you, tearing down what God is building up in you. Food, in many ways, and I'm going to turn it over, has become a dangerous drug for the believer. A misguided means, I'm, I'm preaching, of escape and satisfaction. I'm at a place now where I, it, I, it doesn't always work, but I start asking myself, are you hungry or are you just eating? See, the clock doesn't tell me, should not dictate if it's 12 o'clock, lunchtime, amen. You still, you have breakfast at 10, but it's lunchtime at 12. Come on, come on, say amen. Instead of saying, I don't think I'm hungry. I better keep going. While you're taking care of others, make sure that your diet is taking care of you. Here's a tip we brought, we were looking for a tip. So how in the world do I eat less? We let first lady like, huh? This is a tip. I'm, I think it's a good tip. I personally think it's a good tip. Before you eat anything, drink how many ounces? Eight full ounces. I don't like this tip. I don't agree with this. See, I'm leaning over here on her side. Of the, amen. Eight full ounces of water before you eat anything. And it triggers your mind to say something that your mind's been trying to tell you all along is, 
I'm full. And when you're full, you don't feel led to obey your mama. I better unpack that. That got a little ugly. Mama always say, boy, girl, eat everything on this plate. Well, that's good when you're 10 because your metabolism is on blast. But when you hit 35... Leave something on the plate. I better, I'm going to keep So that it. means if I drink that eight ounces of water, then I'm not going to finish the whole order of fries. That's why you, that's why you don't supersize. I don't get to eat all my fries. No. But you get to keep all your looks. The boom. Ooh. See, I know it's going to come down to that. You get to look good. And, even, and then the, the extra bonus is you actually get to feel good. That's right. That's right. Just saying. I'm sorry, mama. This ain't your typical mama day message. Where she's sweet. She's kind. Now we're going in today, bro. Take care of yourself. It's important that mama takes care of herself. It's important yes. that we all take care of ourselves. You mentioned definitely coming out of COVID. Yeah. It is a time for us to make sure we're practicing self-care. So our final insight today is to cultivate, be selfish, be selfish, just a little selfish. And you want to cultivate your spiritual health. Yeah. Cultivate your spiritual health. And, and before we jump in, please know it is important that you know your your spiritual health, cultivating your spiritual health is not going to happen overnight. That's good. It is a process. It is a gradual process. And we're all in different places in that process, but That's it's a good. gradual process because we're going to take a look here at Hebrews. And and my brother Paul is, is, is hard. Paul tells the truth. And sometimes the truth is not, is not easy to hear. But Paul tells us something here in Hebrews that's important that we, he that we hear. So we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 5. Going to look at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature. Check this out. Who because of practice mm -hmm. have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Now, this is an interesting, again, I want to glean some some, some practical truth from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. The Hebrews writer says this, if you pay attention, he says it's not always from the Bible or from the pulpit or from the books that people learn what Christianity is. This is important as we talk about nurturing your spiritual health. It's not always from messages or uh, daily breads or uh, a verse a day that people learn what Christianity is. Because quite honestly, the average unsaved person is not going to come into contact with a message with a daily bread. Or they're not. They just aren't. The average unsaved person learns about Christianity from the daily walk of those who say they profess a love for Jesus Christ. That's good and bad. Those who profess to be a child of God are the sole example of what Christianity is or isn't for many people. They're not going to go to your website and go to your web page. They're going to go to your life. Mm, that's interesting, isn't it? And so then we're not talking about being holy roller, Rodney. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, laced up from the, from the, from the lace up to the, to the bottom of the shoes. But we're talking about um, your life, managing your life in such a way that people see something that's different about you. That you're a little off. Jennifer, you're a little bit odd. It's like that, that lady, she's different than the other ladies around her. Every day we live, a wife, a husband, a child, a neighbor, a stranger is forming some view regarding the nature of religion in Christ from what they see in us. So we do this. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's, it's, it's an important to note here because um, it is not... We're not saying you have to attend a seminary mm -hmm. or you have to get your doctorate in religion to be that kind of example. But it is your lifestyle and your daily conversation that, that, that folks are seeing. The Hebrew writer says here that the intake of solid food is done by those who 
practice, who by practice, by practice have trained their sense of discernment. Do you know how important discernment is for a believer? It is so important that we can discern and that we're hearing from God. And that comes by practicing just some daily spiritual disciplines. Mm. It is by practice that we train our sense of discernment. You know, that's that's a really impressive trait or quality of Christianity for a non-believer is when you when you have discernment, when you go, hmm, I don't know that that, you know, I'm not really sure that, yeah, I heard that that was what's up, but I'm not going to go all in yet. And then they come back to you and they say, how did you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you'll say, you know, I, I, me and the Lord, we got a relationship. And I just, Spirit of God just kind of, you know, without going hocus pocus, the Spirit of God just kind of led me not to, or the Spirit of God told me to trust it. How did you know to trust that? Mm-hmm. And I will say some people, like my husband, have that gift of discernment. I mean, it's just natural for him. But for those of us who don't have it, I think Paul is telling us that we can learn it by practicing some of these disciplines That's that good. we can be discerning as well. So it cannot be, ooh, I just don't know. I don't have to give the discernment. <laughs> no. By staying in God's word and staying in God's face and being sensitive to his voice, the Lord will speak to us even though we may not have that gift. The white just has it naturally. Mm. It takes me a minute. I'm not touching any of that. Um so what are those practices, though? That's a good that's a good word. Several, mm-hmm. several examples, several. Well, we brought a few examples. Well, they're not the only examples. But here, how do I gain that spiritual discernment? How do I practice? Paul said that that food, solid food is for the mature who have practiced something. What is he talking about practicing? He's saying that you get this practice and gain discernment. Watch this one Bible reading at a time. I get two daily scriptures on my phone every morning from two different sources. And the temptation is, is to scroll right past it to see what's on CNN. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Did, did, did the Hawks win yesterday? Well, amen. <laughs> amen. To scroll right past the biblical truth. See, but you got to understand something that when you stop to read that one verse and you stop the presses to read that one verse, you're practicing what's going to lead to spiritual discernment. How about this? One prayer vigil at a time. I didn't say one prayer at a time, Jasmine. I didn't say one prayer. I said one prayer vigil at a time. Come on, Tiffany. We're not talking about Lord bless me. This Monday, our Lord bless me Monday, Lord bless me on Tuesday, Lord bless me on Wednesday. Come on, I'm just, I'm going to go in. It's the week three. Lord, you didn't bless me yet. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about a prayer vigil at a time. Not just the one, oh, I, you know, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank, did I thank you yesterday? That prayer vigil leads to this practice of spiritual discernment. How about this one church fellowship at a time? We got grand announcement. We're making plans to come back to church. And some of you have been a little off of your practice of discernment because you hadn't had your fellowship like you're accustomed to. The scripture says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. There's something about being in the middle of the mess. Come on, come on, church is a mess. Can I have an amen? We ain't we doing the best we can with what God gave us. Come on, somebody please say amen. amen. Folk coming up here for perfection, go someplace else, we're going to disappoint you. But if you want to go someplace where folks are working through, come on, and trying to, and trying to love on each other anyway, Crossroads is your spot. One test of faith at a time helps build discernment. And a test of faith, I wish, Jason, that a test of faith would be like a drive through order. I have a number one. Come around. <laughs> test of faith don't work like that. God tests your faith from every angle. <laughs> it's like, and so when you make it through that, you're practicing what will lead to discernment. Lastly, One Bible reading at a time, one prayer vigil at a time, one church fellowship at a time, one test of faith at a time. And watch this. This is my best part. One victory at a time. See, don't be so quick to run past your victory. Savor that thing. Because it might be a minute. (laughs) I'm just trying to teach today. (laughs) Before you get another one. So you might want to just save. Okay, Lord, what did I learn and what did I do and what did you want to teach me and how should I share this victory? Yeah. Amen. I want to end this to, today with um, a question. We told you to nurture your own um, 
mental health, and we told you to improve your own physical health. And we t- notice that we put your own in there because it's an emphasis. And we told you to cultivate your own, because mama, you're busy taking care of everybody else, cultivate your own spiritual health. So how do you do that? What, so what are some of the ways we can do that? One of the things that we talk about in men's discipleship is to check the gauges. But for this purpose, we're going to tell you, check your battery. We want to show you something. We brought an image with us to get, help you to understand. So when you're checking your battery, you ask yourself a series of questions. And based on those questions, you make the adjustment you need to make. Right off the top, the, the highest level when the battery is really full and you check it, it'll say this. Here's an indicator. It'll say, feeling great. If you check your battery and you're feeling great, cool. Keep meeting your needs and keep practicing your self-care. If you're in a good place, can I say this first? Stop apologizing to people because you're in a good place. You know that person every time you see them. Right? Oh, Lord, here he comes. Doom and gloom. We're doomed. We're doomed. We're, doomed. We're not going to make it. I'm done apologizing. How am I doing? I am doing well. God gave me a great doctor's report. I'm, I'm, I'm doing as better as I've ever been. This is working. That is working. Praise be to God. The next indicator is? Next indicator is feeling good. And when you're feeling good, what you want to do is ask yourself is, how do I maintain the levels that I'm currently at? Because I want to get back to great. But I need to maintain where I am because I'm feeling good right now. Mm. After that, so we got feeling great. The battery is depleting now. Feeling good. Then maybe you just say, "Ah, I'm feeling okay. Then it's time to ask a question. What could I do to make my day brighter? See, this is what happens. Not your whole life. Not your whole situation. Just today. today. Maybe I'm going to go. Maybe I'm going to take my car and drive over there to uh, the the park or to the lake, and I'm going to get out. I'm going to get me a sandwich, a healthy sandwich. I'm going to get me a sandwich, and I'm going to sit by the lake and just chill out because I'm just okay today. Amen. Or maybe you're you're not feeling okay. The next level down, and say, how are you feeling? You're like, eh, meh, right? So then you got to ask yourself, how do I love myself more today? Mm. Because when you get down, chances are somebody's depleting from you. And you're like, why am I feeling so down? Folks are pulling from you. You got to ask yourself, how can I be kind to me today? And then the next indicator is struggling. And that's warning. That's a warning sign. If you're struggling, then it's time to practice some triage. It's Mm -hmm. trying to do something deliberate. And so you got to identify that area of your life that you're struggling in. Is it family? Is it my job? Is it, what is it? But you've got to identify it. Right now, right now, and then you have got you identify that thing that's dragging you down, and then you focus on that one area. That one. It's important. You don't have to fix the world. You don't have to fix all the kids' problems. You want to focus on this one area that's dragging you down, so that you can address it. And lastly, you've gone from your and it depends. And it depends. We're not saying that you're gonna always. De- Go, go down in, in your energy level. We're just saying when you check, if one of these indicators pops up, that's how you respond. So let's suppose you're not feeling great, you're not feeling good, you're not feeling okay, you're feeling kind of met, you're kind of struggling. Let's say you're at the bottom, the red the red part where the light comes on and the car that says you need some gas because you're trying to ignore the, the gauge. So the light come on and say, okay, we ain't playing. <laughs> Keep on driving if you want to. You're going to be walking. So sometimes your battery starts flashing. We used to call it an idiot light when we first started. Idiot light, come on, say engine check, because you ain't checked the engine in a while. Or So when you get that I'm empty sign, you have to pinpoint what's draining you now. It's like, okay, something's draining me. Listen to what, I'm, listen to what we're talking about. Don't wallow in the fact that you're draining. Now you're on a hunting expedition. What, what is draining me? And you got to start looking around your life and say, there's something or someone Mm-hmm. That, are, that, are, that are draining me. And so then when you identify that thing, you got to create a boundary and then do the one thing that's going to fill you up. So it's okay when something's draining you to build up a fence behind it and leave it over there. And on the other side of the fence, you fill yourself back up. Amen. Amen. See, what happens, this is important and we're, and we're done. This is important for Mother's Day because moms, let's be honest, people pull on you all the time. 
And we want to give you permission to be okay, to feel great, to feel good, to feel okay, to feel met, to be struggling, to be empty. But we want you to be honest about it, isolate it, and keep it moving rather than wallowing in it. Because here's what's up. The question that we asked to begin this message is, if I'm taking care of you, who's taking care of me? And the answer is, the Lord's got you, but there is a season when you need to help him a little bit and take care of yourself. Can I have an amen? Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ. We thank you so very much for giving us a word of instruction today. I'm not so much flowery and not so much, uh, uh, you know, that kind of a thing, but a bit of a challenge today for our mothers to go ahead and to begin to initiate some self-care mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and physically. And we know that it's not always easy, but it's always necessary. We thank you so very much for all you're doing and all you're going to do in their lives. It's in Christ's name we pray, and for his sake we say, amen. I know we were talking about taking care of ourselves here, but I want to ask this question of you about um, whether or not you've figured, whether or not you've allowed Christ to take care of you. See, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him won't perish, but will have something called everlasting life. And so then God is ready, willing, and this is my favorite part, Jennifer, able to take care of me. Amen. There's going to be a season sometimes when you are a little down and you're going to have to lean and trust, depend on, on Christ. But you have to know him in order to, to be able to lean on him and trust him and depend him. And so how do we do that, Pastor? Well, you come to the conclusion in your life that I need the Lord Jesus Christ in the free pardon of my sin. I know that I'm not right with God the Father. I know that I'm trying, but my best efforts aren't working. So the Bible is filled with many opportunities of this phrase, whosoever will, let him or her come. I want to offer you an opportunity today. If you're wearied from trying to take care of yourself, how about leaning and depending on Jesus? Hmm. And for those of you who don't know him and the free pardon of your sin, and you're ready to raise your right hand wherever you are. And if you're rolling, I want you to pull over, raise your right hand. If you're Got something on the stove, turn it off and raise your right hand. Come on. Because I know there's somebody listening today that said, you know what? I I do need, the Lord's got to take care of me. I'm exhausted. And I haven't given my life to him. And I know that I need to. Come on, raise your right hand. Pray with me. Father, I come to you openly exhausted. The burden of my sin is weighing me down. But I heard a promise that you're in the business of removing sin. And so today, as a songwriter said, I give myself away. I give all of me to you. I give of all of my strengths to you. I give all of my secrets to you. I give all of my brokenness to you. I give all that I am to you. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Thank you so much for saving me today. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I'm excited. That there's someone who prayed that prayer with me and have now introduced introduced yourself to the kingdom of God. I do really appreciate. I would really appreciate if you would um, go onto our website in the contact area and let us know that you gave your life to Christ so we can celebrate with you. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue worshiping through the act of giving, and uh, today we. Do what we do every Sunday. We understand that God deserves our best offering. What does that look like? For some of us, your best offering is just giving something when you never, you hadn't found your way to giving anything. And then for some of us, you, you really give, a, give an amount that doesn't really bother you at all. It's almost a tip and you kind of just toss it out there as a reflect. Maybe your best offering today would be to go ahead and give God what you believe he's worth. Come on now, somebody said, how could I do that? By giving him something that requires you to depend on him. Mm. 
And then beyond that, speaking of that, the Bible teaches of tithing, which means taking 10% of all that God has given you and returning just 10, uh, just, uh, just, just 10 of it to him. To do the math, God has given you nine apples. And he's saying, he's giving you 10 apples, forgive me. And he's saying, keep nine of those apples for yourself. Just return one to me just to show me that you appreciate me and love me. That's all tithing is. You get the 90, he gets the 10. And then beyond the tithe, there is an opportunity to give an offering. An offering is up and above the tithe. And, it, and it, the offering does a couple of things in the New Testament. It allows the church to plug holes because ministering creates opportunities for ministry. The more you minister, the more opportunities are created to minister. And sometimes the church uh, is not prepared fiscally to handle the new ministry, but those folks who are giving an offering above normal enable us to minister on the other side of the four walls of our church. And we thank you for that. I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are, but I do know that God deserves your best offering. How do I give my best offering? You can put it in the envelope. And address it to 304 Fairburn Industrial Boulevard, 30213. Or you can um, come by the church, which some, some are doing, put it in an envelope and slide it underneath the door. And every week we, we gather those and make sure that they go where they need to go. Or you could stay in the comfort of your own home on your phone or your computer or your tablet and give on our online portal, which 90-something percent of you do every week. Again, I don't know where you are and I don't need to know, but God does. I ask that you honor him by giving him your best offering. Father, we thank you so very much for those who are about to release their offering. We pray that you speak to their hearts, that they'll be feel comfortable enough to give you not just an offering, but their best offering. It's in Christ's name we pray and for his sake we say, amen.
Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ. We thank you so very much for this offering that was taken for the uplifting of your build of your kingdom. We pray, Father, that uh, we that you would bless those who wanted to give but just could not give. We ask that you move in their lives in such a way that even in the middle of the week, you reminded them, you remind them of just how good you are. We thank you, Father, uh, for the management and for the taking care of, uh, for lack of another word, Father, the the stewardship. Um, that has been a hallmark of this ministry for such a long time. We are not, um, Father, blind to the fact that it's something that we have to continue to work on. And we thank you for, for two decades almost, so a decade and a half, you've allowed us to be a, a church of integrity. We thank you so very much. I don't know why I feel led to, to share that, but I just thank you, Father, for the, for the reality that it's true. Bless this offering. May it be used again for the uplifting and building of your kingdom. So that people can find, through Crossroads Church, a place where they can find real life answers and experience real life change. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. It is in the mighty name of Christ we pray. And for his sake we say, amen. I want to give you, uh, I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the moms all over listening to us. Again, a special shout out for First Lady for being, for being so willing to continue to uh, stand next to, to, to Pastor and, and to teach the Word of God. We thank you so very much, First Lady. Amen. Appreciate you more than I tell you, and more than you know. Now, come back next week as we continue with this question of what's the point? And so we're, we're, we're going to spend a couple of weeks on this idea. Come back. All, all, the next week's message is a universal message because not only are our mothers asking what's the point, but all the, the, the millennials and all the singles and, and all the divorcees and all the newly married are sometimes asking the question, what's the point? So don't miss this series. Tell somebody, somebody if somebody's asking that question, what's the point? Come on. Point them to this, to this broadcast so they can get the inside of the word of God. So here's what's up. We are making plans to open up the doors of the church again. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. No more preaching the green beans and, and boxes of macaroni and cheese. God is good. How often? All the time. All the time, God is good. So here's what's up, though. We got a bunch of information to share with you about what it's going to look like when we come back. I know you got a bunch of questions about what do we do when we return. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to www.crossroadstoday.org slash update us. So it's our regular website, crossroadstoday.org slash update us. And when you get there, you'll land on a page that gives you an opportunity to fill in your contact information. I said your contact information. Some folks hate email. Some folks love it. Some folks hate text. Some folks love it. Some folks hate the mailbox. Some folks love it. I need you to give me all your contact information so that I can touch you in the way you love. If you want to know what we're doing next and we got plans, I can't give that information to you. Our church we have a whole team we're tossing at coming back to make sure we do this decently and in order. But we need you to do something for us to go to www.crossroadstoday.org slash update us. Now, here's what's up. I know some of you are saying, but y'all should have my information. The operative word is should. We may have it. <laughs> we, we may not have it. Let me tell you something. I've moved. My address was the same for 22 years until about three or four weeks ago. So people shift and things change. Numbers change. So do us a favor. Don't assume that we have it. Make sure we have it. www.crossroadstoday.org slash update us. Now, I got to give a shout out to my sister in Maryland. When she heard that we were doing this, she updated her information right away. Come on, Georgia. Don't let the out-of-town members of Crossroads Church send me that information before you do it. That's a challenge to Georgia. Get it in. Do it today. I want to go to the website tonight and see 200 folks that have updated their information. Come on, amen, 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 and amen. We are planning to come back. We got a three-tier 
come back. I can't give it all to you because I want you to get it in writing and get it in video and, and get it in the social media feed. But we have a three phase approach to coming back. But you know how you can hit, get information from that by going on to, uh, to our, cross, our website, update us. I'm done. See you next week when we continue the series. What's the point? I want you to continue, though, three things for me. I need you to be strong. I need you to be safe. Because I have a good authority that when you're strong and when you're safe, you're always going to be blessed. I do love you. Take care. See you next week. Peace.